Okay. Uh, Dr. Zawab Safat Ibrahim. She has a medical doctoral degree in anesthesiology and uh, surgical intensive care from Alexandria University. She's a staff member uh, in anesthesia department in Alexandria University. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Zawab for her time to come tonight and uh, to chair this program uh, with the two distinguished speakers tonight, uh, Dr. Huda Fauzi and Dr. Ahmed Hagadi. Uh, Dr. Rabab, all yours now. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahdi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, dear panelists, speakers, and attendees, uh, on behalf of the Educational Board of the Mega Medical Association and the Egyptian Society of Anesthesiology, uh, I warmly welcome you tonight to a new session from the Mega uh, Medical Online Course. Of course, thank you very much, Dr. Mahdi and your team for all the efforts. And it's always a great honor and pleasure for me uh, to uh, be with you. And it's a pleasure for me and honor to moderate tonight's session. Um, tonight, uh, on the speaker side, we have two distinguished speakers, Dr. Hoda Fawzi and Dr. Ahmed Higazi, presenting to us uh, two interesting and important topics. Uh, please allow me first to welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Hoda Fawzi from Egypt. Uh, Dr. Fawzi has got an MD uh, in anesthesia and surgical intensive care, Alexandria University, Egypt, and she's a staff member, anesthetic department, Alexandria University, Egypt. Tonight, she's going to shed some light on the um, uh, anesthetic management of simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant. Dr. Hoda, the floor is yours. Dr. Abbas, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saad. Thanks for everyone in the course. Uh, allow me to share my screen. So uh, our uh, lecture today is just to give a brief introduction. I try to make it as comprehensive as possible as easy uh, like bullets for uh, simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant. Um, it is now a growing uh, procedure uh, for the management of diabetes and renal failure. So uh, to start with, let's summarize what we're going to go through during this lecture today. So we're going to identify what are we transplanting in the simultaneous a kidney pancreas transplant. How are we doing this? And what are the challenges we're going to face when having this procedure? Most probably those challenges are some uh, bleeding, uh, hypoglycemia, pain control, and it's a long procedure. It's around eight, 10 hours procedure. So uh, before going to the procedure itself, let's shed a light about the types of pancreas transplant. Uh, first, we have the pancreas transplant alone, where the um, uh, pancreas is just transplanted without the kidney transplant. Usually it's uh, like a brain dead person. It's uh, we couldn't, we can't take a pancreas from a living person. So it's a dead donor pancreas transplant. Uh, pancreas after kidney transplant, where we First, do a kidney transplant, and then after a while, months, weeks, we decide to do the pancreas transplant. A simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant, where we, in the same session, we transplant the pancreas and the kidney, both are like, not live donor, it's um, brain dead or whatever the reason. And lastly, is the simultaneous pancreas live donor kidney. Our lecture today would be on the simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant. So what are we transplanting during this procedure? From, for the renal side, we are transplanting uh, the renal artery into uh, the recipient's common iliac artery, the renal vein from the, for the uh, recipient iliac vein. We are uh, joining the ureter to the recipient bladder. And usually this is uh, situated in the extraperitoneal left iliac fossa. Why is it uh, 
extraperitoneal because during the course of the post-operative, sometimes uh, biopsies from the transplanted kidney is needed to diagnose whatever issues happen. So it's better to put the kidney extraperitoneal. This raises two options or two uh, challenges. It's that uh, we'll go through it with the muscle relaxation because the, if the muscles are not well relaxed, this will cause avulsion of the graft and the post-operative biopsies. This is regarding the renal side of the procedure. Uh, the pancreatic side, it's a little bit more complicated. So the donor, uh, when uh, the uh, pancreas is harvested, it's taken with part of the uh, donor duodenum. This is for the exocrine function of the pancreas. So usually the donor duodenum is anastomosed with the recipient small intestine. In the earlier years of transplant, and less commonly now, it was um, transplanted to the bladder, but they found it causes metabolic abnormalities, urinary tract problems. So now it's most commonly to the recipient's small intestine. Uh, the donor portal vein is anastomosed to the iliac vein or the inferior vena cava of the recipient. Uh, the Y graft is transplanted or uh, stitched to the recipient common iliac artery, just to give a highlight what is a Y graft. Usually the pancreas has a dual uh, blood supply from the celiac artery and the superior mesenteric vein. So the donors, common iliac, internal and external iliacs are used to make a Y graft. This is to make like a single uh, port blood supply um, stitch to the recipient common iliac artery. Uh, the position of the pancreatic graft is usually intraperitoneal lying on the right side of the pelvis. So this is how things are going to happen during the procedure. From now on, we'll go in the how and the challenges side by side, taking it step by step as it were in the procedure. So how is this done? From the challenges, the preoperative challenge. Baseline, we have a diabetic patient. He is usually coming to theaters on a very relieved insulin to control the blood diabetes. And this has to be very closely monitored during the procedure because once the pancreas is perfused, if the vari variable rate uh, insulin is still running, the patient is at risk of hyperglycemia. Uh, Basically, the patient is coming for the procedure is suffering from renal failure. So he is on the dialysis schedule. He might have electrolyte problems. Uh, the blood pressure might be an issue because most renal patients are hypertensive. And other things. The patient might not only be diabetic and in renal failure. He might be a cardiac patient, respiratory patient. So this needs to be very well uh, assessed diagnosed and planned on how are we going to manage it. Uh, what preparations we need to do before even starting the procedure? As I said, the preoperative assessment of the patient and knowing what is our patient looking like before the procedure. Blood components must be ready and available. SPK is a bloody procedure. There might be a blood loss during the procedure, especially during the perfusion of the pancreas. Uh, intraoperative medication plan. This is also must be discussed and planned preoperative. We give the patient antibiotics. We give the patient immunosuppressives. We need some uh, uh, renal protection. This is to be done for the patient before transplanting the kidney. So this must be prepared and discussed in a multidisciplinary uh, meeting before the procedure. Uh, how am I going to transfuse blood rapidly if bleeding happens? Uh, what are the facilities I have? Am I just going to simply, as most of us do, like a uh, syringe uh, blood transfusion, or I have the equipments for a blood transfusion? And one of the most important things is staff breaks. It, as I said, it's a long procedure. It's a, an eight to 10 hours procedure. So we should plan who is going to be attending, who is going to start, who is going to give breaks. This is an important thing for the staff well-being.
Now we prepared everything post-operative. We uh, prepared the patient, we prepared the theater. Uh, we are starting our intraoperative part of the procedure. So monitoring wise for uh, SPK, number one, it's the routine monitoring, the AGBI basic monitoring, ECG, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, temperature, and urine output. Temperature is specifically important because uh, it's sort of the graft protection. So we must keep the homeostasis of the patient and the temperature to prevent vasoconstriction of the vessels, which is important to their bad uh, viability. Arterial line, but bear in mind, you might have an arm with a fistula. This arm, if the patient is coming with um, uh, an arm with a fistula, this arm should be clearly marked, should be treated uh, with uh, cautious, it should not be under compression, it should not be monitored with an arterial line, so bear in mind the arm with fistula if it's present. And since we're putting an arterial line, we can have a cardiac output monitoring. Uh, central venous pressure monitoring. Uh, we should put a central venous catheter. This is to manage uh, fluids uh, intra and post operative. Uh, input and output, if we need to give um, enotropic support to maintain the circulation for the viability of the cat, it's uh, done through the central venous pressure catheter. And uh, just bear in mind, try to avoid the subclavian vessels. Again, this patient is in renal failure. The graft might not work well and you might need to do a fistula for the patient later. Cannulating the subclavian vessels might result in thrombosis, which renders the uh, fistula difficult. And it's a precious thing for the renal failure patient. Last thing, it's the neuromuscular monitoring. As we said, the, uh, the kidney is placed extra peritoneal. So if the patient is not relaxed and monitored during removal of the refractors, which will go, come through later, it might cause avulsion of the graft. And this is like wasting uh, graft, wasting time, wasting the safety of patients. So we must apply neuromuscular monitoring. Completing the intraoperative part, should we insert an epidural? In times epidural were used as post-operative pain relief, we will give you, a, I'll try to show you how big is the incision, how painful it might be. So in the time it was uh, a trend to give the epidural, but uh, it is not the, the best practice now for a couple of things. Epidural has its hemodynamic effects. It decreases the blood pressure and we try to maintain the, the blood pressure for the gas viability. And it's better to avoid uh, vasoconstrictors if we can for the, to, to prevent vasoconstriction. So it's better to avoid epidural. One other thing is that those patients most probably are anticoagulated post-operative. This is again for the viability of the graft. Having an epidural and giving um, uh, thrombo, uh, thromboprophylaxis might be uh, problematic. Again, there might be some thrombosis and they might need heparin infusions to keep the graft and then the epidural is still a problem. So, and as long as we have better alternative to that, including the PCA, the rectus sheath catheters, it's better to avoid the epidural. And we must plan the post-operative dialysis axis. Does this patient have a fistula or not? If not, then when putting the central venous catheter, we might need to put a dialysis catheter intraoperative for the patient to dialyze just in case the graft doesn't do a great job. completing our intraoperative period. Induction and maintenance of the patient. So now the patient is here, we monitored the patient, we decided what cannulation we're going to do to the patient and we're ready to start the procedure. It's always easier said than done. The, the aim for the induction and maintenance is hemodynamic stability, which is done by keeping the homeostasis both vascular, electrolyte, hematology, and thermal. As difficult as it sounds, but as long as you have the proper monitoring and you're keeping an eye on the patient and you know what you're expecting, it is doable. 
And one of the things we need to bear in mind during the interoperative period is the graph protection both for the pancreas and the kidney. This is how the field usually looks like. So it's a bigger, biggish incision. It is retracted, so it's painful. So, so we need to control the pain and it needs a good muscle relaxation. So this is why it's an issue, muscle relaxation and pain relief intra and post operative. Going step by step through, through the procedure. So for the induction, modified rapid sequence induction is a convenient method because renal failure patients are known to have gastroparesis and delayed uh, gastric emptying. But again, it's just uh, a way of doing it. You can do it whatever you prefer. Maintenance, as we said, neuromuscular uh, agent infusion. It's uh, important uh, keeping the chain of cord in the range of uh, two to inches of four to give a good um, feel for the surgeons and to prevent graft avulsion. Analgesia is usually done by infusion. And it's important, frequent sampling for electrolytes, blood sugar, and hemoglobin. This sampling is usually done every hour. It could be done more frequent in like critical situations of the procedure, which we'll go through. Um, hemodynamic stability is achieved by uh, blood pressure we giving fluids versus vasopressor. Remember, this patient is a renal failure patient. We, we can easily go in fluid overload. In situations when the patient is uh, highly uh, fluid overloaded or the potassium is very difficult to control, we might have to do intraoperative dialysis to the patient. This is why we have to think about the dialysis access during induction, in case I will need to dialyze this patient in front. Homeostasis, this is done, as I said, uh, by keeping the patient warm from the beginning and frequent sampling. Uh, this is where the arterial lines and the central venous catheter come of importance. Uh, bear in mind the glucose and the potassium. So how are we going to protect the grafts, our, what's our role in graft, graft protection in So protection of the pancreas, uh, as I said, it's a multidisciplinary and a needs preparation. So antibiotics and the immunosuppressive should be decided preoperatively. Uh, antibiotics are usually given shortly after induction. Immunosuppressives are usually given when we're taking the uh, graft from out uh, from the eyes. This is the time where we give the immunosuppressives, which is either methyl, uh, prednisolone or other agents beside the operative. Rarely we can use epoprostenol. Uh, it's not routinely used. It enhances the graft perfusion. It's important to say that during the procedure, the pancreas graft is uh, transplanted first and then the kidney is transplanted. So this is why we need to keep in mind. Uh, kidney protection, we usually give the patient a manitol 10%, again, when the kidney, the uh, graft kidney is taken out of the eyes, and uh, fluzimide, again, when the kidney is uh, taken out of the eyes. The immunosuppressive, we don't dub, uh, duplicate the immunosuppressive, whatever the patient is taking for the pancreas, it works for the kidney, we don't give another other immunosuppressive. And it is important to declare that it's all decided preoperative. I must know what I'm giving to the patient before we start the procedure. Uh, so to summarize, antibiotics usually given shortly after induction, immunosuppressives when taking the pancreas out from the eyes, renal protection medications when taking the kidney out of eyes. So just to bear in mind, what are the critical times that uh, we need to give extra attention to the patients. As an institutist, we must give our full attention to the patient or through the procedure, but there are times where I need to be like extra cautious, extra uh, careful and anticipation. The anesthetic is all mostly about anticipation. During the pancreas sleep perfusion, it's a critical time. It's the time where bleeding happens. It can be massive bleeding. It can reach easily one, two liters of bleed. This is why I must have the uh, blood uh, 
components ready and available. Hypoglycemia, again, the patient arrives with theaters on variable uh, rate insulin. If the pancreas is diffused and started doing its endocrine function with insulin going, there is a risk of hypoglycemia. Hyperkalemia, uh, a graft is preserved in ice. It has been in metabolic uh, isolation. It was not connected to any uh, blood vessel to venous, venous drainage. So there is always a risk of hyperkalemia, whether with the pancreas transplant when the graft is in and the kidney. So take care of the hyperkalemia. During the renal reperfusion, there is the risk of hyperkalemia. So those are the times where we need to sample more frequently. We can sample even every 30 minutes to try to manage the hyperkalemia, whether by in insulin uh, glucose infusion, whether by using calcium gluconate, whether giving bicarb, or even we can start dialyzing the patient intraoperative for the hypertension. The third critical time is the removal of the retractor, the possibility of avulsion if the patient is not fully relaxed. This is a time of uh, uh, crucial communication between the surgeon and anesthetist. We must tell the surgeons, please let us know before you take the retractors out. Uh, the patient might be, must be monitored. If not relaxed, then I might give a bolus of the neuromuscular uh, infusion. Post-operatively, uh, pain relief is important in the post-operative. This is our part of the post-operative period. Pain relief, it can be a PCA, and we can ask the surgeon to put the erectus sheaths catheters. Uh, we must mention that post-operative care for a kidney uh, pancreas transplant patient is a multidisciplinary uh, act. It's transplant team, renal team, surgical team, and we have our role in the first like 30 minutes an hour for the pain and fluid management. So to summarize, SPK is a multidisciplinary procedure. Preoperative preparation is of utmost importance. Intraoperative communication is very important. And always stay updated. Science changes. What's right today might be wrong tomorrow, so just stay updated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoda. That was very um, informative and very interesting. Uh, I don't have any questions for you at the moment. 